Okay, good. Then let's continue. Trying to do this here. Doesn't work right now. Ah, I don't know if that was me. Yeah, that was me. Okay, so now we're getting to the father's character and roles. Yeah, we may call that also theological job description. Not sure if that's the right term, but that, I made that up. Uh, but it's thinking about the different roles that the father has. And it seems that each person of the Trinity has some specific roles in which they take primary responsibility. And if we, if we think about it, we may say it like this. While all the attributes of God are shared equally by each member of the Trinity, at least five aspects appear central to the Father's personal role in the Godhead. Uh, yes? Scott Horrell a lot. I was just about to say something about him. This is the one that I had as a professor at Dallas Seminary. Uh, well, he was about to publish it when I was a student, and last I saw him, he hasn't still uh, published it. But I, I keep in touch with him. I'm not sure if I should ask him when I see him in August, uh, or if that's a sore spot for him. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I have stayed in touch with him. I told him I've teached about this in Ukraine and Germany and now here in the U.S. as well. Um, and he, uh, I, I have his updated notes and they already look a lot more publishable now. <laughs> but it's still not completely uh, published. But if, if he, when he publishes it, uh, it will be a major textbook. I mean, it will be big. Um, yeah, so, so he has a lot that he has in there. And we're taking some of that. Um, okay, so he's talking about the, different, the three members of the Trinity and what they share. They share equally in the divine nature. But then on the other side, there are certain, we may call that functions or roles, where they each differ from each other, where each one of them takes on some unique responsibilities. And again, the term that we usually use here then would be function or role. And there are five of these with regard to the Father that we want to look at now. Now the first one uh, has a Latin expression originally to it. In English we may call it the divine fountainhead. What do I mean by that? I will show in a minute. The Latin would be fons divinitatis. And then the other ones are a little bit more understandable maybe. Second is sovereign ruler. Third, he is the Lord Chief Justice. Fourth, he is the compassionate reconciler. And fifth, he is him to whom all things return. And I'm also still thinking that maybe we can come up with some other more uh, name for that. But that's the term he used for it, and I'll, I'll leave those um, for now. So, um, yeah, again, quoting him, explaining these five roles, some of the things I've just said already, he says, I would add that in some sense these roles are not exclusive to the Father, but they do characterize the place of the Father in relation to the Son and the Spirit within God's outworking into the world. Now that's actually an important phrase, his outworking into the world. That means how God relates to the world. Some people distinguish that in how he may be relating to himself. Here we are seeing him how he relates to creation and to the world. Indeed, in every act of God into creation, it seems that one person of the Trinity is primary, and the other two are secondary. Okay, so we are looking at these functions where the Father now is primary. That doesn't mean that the other two are excluded from them. It just means that he is taking on a primary role and responsibility for the, these five roles. So first, fons divinitatis, what do we mean by that? Well, first of all, creation. Creation itself, you may turn to the first verses of the Bible here, Genesis 1, 1. Maybe somebody else could turn to Hebrews uh, 11, 3. Um, and we see, well, obviously, that God has created the world. Somebody have Hebrews 11, 3 ready for us and willing to read. Mm -hmm. So God is the creator, and he did it by his word. And that we see in Genesis 1 as well. Maybe somebody could read verse 1 there for us. And 2. Or 
or I do. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, and so on. So God created the heavens and the earth. And then he did that and somehow involved also the spirit who was there. And he did it by his word. Now, if we remember yesterday, if we talked about the Old Testament, reading this a little bit in light of the New Testament, and we could look at a number of verses there now, it seems that the Father takes on primary responsibility, the reference being God in the beginning. And then we see that the other two are somehow as agents involved in the act of creation, both the Spirit and the Word. And so again, the idea seems to be that the Father is taking on a primary responsibility with the other two joining in in this act of creation. The same we could say for the divine act of salvation and predestination. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1 here, verses 3 to 5. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's the Father of whom we speak here. And the references I highlighted and read. Who has blessed us with every uh, spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. For he, again still the Father, for he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we may be holy and unblemished in his sight in love. So he, okay, that's too far. Well, he is the one who has designed then also the plan of salvation, the Father. The Father is the one who, who, um, yeah, who initiated this plan of salvation and he does it then and he accomplishes then through his Son and the Spirit is involved as well. But again, it begins with the Father. He is the divine fountainhead, both in creation and salvation. He is also the unsent sender, we may say, um, because we see that the Son is being sent. And we see that the Spirit is being sent, both by the Father and the Son. The only one who is not being sent is the Father. He's the only one who is only sending others, but he is therefore the unsent sender. And in that sense, he's primary, even within the outworking of the Trinity. Um, he is the divine fountainhead or the center of the Godhead. And we see that he's being called the origin of all, Ephesians 4, 6. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So all of these characterize the first role of the Father as the divine fountainhead, we may say. Secondly, he is the sovereign ruler. Well, that means he is, first of all, the all-powerful heavenly monarch. And he is also the Lord of heaven and earth. Oh, that was too fast. Let's look at a couple of passages here. The heavens, indeed, the highest heavens, belong to the Lord your God, as does the earth and everything in it. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords the great, mighty, and awesome God who is unbiased and takes no bribe. And then in the New Testament, we find a similar description. Now to the eternal king, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And a little bit later at the end of the epistle, whose, and this is talking about Jesus, appearing... The blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, will reveal at the right time. And we see from the context, therefore, a distinction between the Son and the Father here, because it's speaking about the appearing of Jesus the Son. But it seems to be another one who is revealing this, and this other one is being described as the sovereign, or the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. And therefore, this is particularly, not only, not exclusively, but particularly descriptive of God the Father. We also see that he is the rightful king of Israel and the nations. Turning back to the Old Testament, in 2 uh, Kings 19, 
15, Hezekiah prayed before the Lord, Lord God of Israel, who is enthroned on the cherubs, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You made the sky and the earth. So God is the sovereign ruler. And this kingdom of this God is being proclaimed then in the New Testament. His kingdom is about to come. And we pray in the, uh, our Father still, thy kingdom come. And this final reign of God, however, awaits the new heaven and the new earth. As we see um, anticipated in the Gospels and then also described at the end of the New Testament in the scriptures and revelations. Okay, so that was that role. Now we come to the next one, the Father's role as Lord Chief Justice. And in that sense, it means that God the Father is the lawgiver. He gives the law. And he also determines what is right and what is wrong. He is the one who can decide that, and he is the one who gives us the difference between right and wrong. It derives from his person and from his activity. We can see this in the Old Testament, Leviticus 18.4. You must observe my regulations, and you must be sure to walk in my statutes. I am the Lord your God. Now, I had to think about children at this point, because children seem to always long to know um, who is the one who has something to say. Now, I call this the rules of the game. Um, our, uh, our daughters, now this is a picture from a birthday party in Ukraine. Our daughter <laughs> Hannah was there. It was the last time I was with her in Ukraine. And it so happened that it was the fifth birthday of a friend of her who really wanted her to be there. And she didn't know that we were back in Germany. And we happened to visit that week. So it was uh, yeah, something special that we were able to actually and attend that. It's a year and a half ago already. Uh, but something I noticed here and here, you just see these kids. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, and um, when they do things, when they play, even among themselves, they want to know um, who can determine what is right and wrong. And, and our daughters talk much longer about the rules than they actually do play something. So the longest time they need to figure out who has to say what they can play and how they are to play this and how they are to do that. That seems to take up most of the time. And they're not so much bothered about actually doing that then. Uh, but they just debate the whole time who has to say something. And so um, it seems very important for us, for our children, that they know sort of the, the boundaries and know what is right and what is wrong. And that has to be given from somewhere outside. And we have God who does this. He is taking on this role. He is the Lord Chief Justice, and he determines right and wrong. And he is the lawgiver. And he is also the judge of the whole earth. In Genesis 18, when God talks to Abraham, we see Abraham referring to this role. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the godly with the wicked, treating the godly and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of the whole, of the whole earth do what is right? Does anybody remember the context of this? What, what are we talking about here? Yeah? Say it. Exactly. Yes, Abraham is debating with God about Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's trying to spare the city. And when he do, does that, in the process, he's referring to God as the judge of the whole earth, and he is the rightful judge. He will do what is right, and obviously he did what is right. Uh, and that moment, as well as in any other moment in history, because he indeed is the judge, the Lord Chief Justice. Now, when we look at the three persons of the Trinity, we can say that all three of them are holy, and they are all just and they are all participating in this role as Lord Chief Justice. But then something interestingly interesting happens as we compare the Testaments. There is a remarkable shift in the New Testament. Now, if we look at the Gospels, we see that. In, for example, at the Gospels, in John 5, 22, Jesus himself says, The Father does not judge anyone, but has assigned all judgment to the Son. 
So Jesus himself says, the Father has given him judgment. And we see that also confirmed by the apostles in Acts 10, verse 42. He, referring back to Jesus in the context, commanded us to preach to the people and to warn them that he is the one appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. So the Father has appointed the Son as judge here. Now, when we take a closer look, though, we will notice that the judgment given is given to the Son. However, the evidence is not so clear throughout the New Testament. We have other passages that seem to point us again in a different direction. Let's look at some of those. For example, John 3, 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that, he would, that, uh, that the world should be saved through him. The one who, and later, the one who believes in him is not condemned. The one who does not believe has been condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. So this seems to sound a little different as well as here in Luke 20, 23, 34 where Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. This is Jesus on the cross, obviously. And those seem to be pointing in a different direction. So what do we do with this? Well, let's read a little bit more uh, in Hebrews 12. Maybe we can turn there and read these verses together. I'm just highlighting here um, the important parts for us here, doctrinally. In Hebrews 12, verse 22 to 24. Would one of you like to read that? Thank you. Again, it seems to be that we are speaking about the two different persons of the Trinity here. Jesus in the latter part, and then God, the Father, in the former part. And um, God, the Father, then, is referred to here as judge of all. And Jesus is referred to specifically here as the mediator of this new covenant. So that, again, seems to point in a different direction. We may also... Um, add revelations to this because in revelations we may may see that both execute the divine wrath and we may ask the question so who is the one who sits on the white throne what do you think at the end of revelations who is the one sitting on the white throne judging God. Ah, very good <laughs> yep but is it the Son or the Father? Well, let me see if we can find some orientation in Revelations itself. Because if we pick up a place from Revelation a little bit earlier in the book of Revelations, in chapter 6, we see this description. Revelation 6, 16 and 17. They said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Because the great day of the wrath has come. And who is able to withstand it? So it's their wrath, both of them. But then again, there is the distinction being made here. And the one who sits on the throne in this passage is clearly the father. The father. Uh, and um, the lamp is uh, yeah, alongside of him mentioned. So you see they are differentiated here in this passage. In the, uh, in the, at the end of Revelations, that is not so clear. We may possibly assume from this passage early on that it might be as well the Father who is sitting on the throne there, on the white throne. In Revelation 20.11 we simply read, And I saw a large, large white, white throne, and the one who was seated on it. The earth and the heaven fled from his presence, and no place was found for them. So here we do not know more, that's all we know, but if we take Revelation 6, it may suggest possibly that it is primarily the Father. 
So Scott Orell, if I quote him again here, he, yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Anybody has an idea? Yeah. So the lamb is the son. Okay. Yeah. And there. Well, there seems to be a suggestion that there are two because it says it combines them with and and it is from the one who is seated on the throne. That's one person. And it seems. From from the from this one and from this one and from the wrath of the Lamb, so that more naturally would seem to not be referring to one and the same person, but to two, and that makes good sense within the context of Revelations because we have the Father and the Son there both, uh, and so in this passage as well as in many others we do have both, and there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, their wrath. Yeah, so good, thank you. Again, that points us that we are talking about more than one person here, and this is probably one person, and this is probably the other. And here it is easy to say which the second one is because of the reference to the Lamb, which refers to our Lord Jesus. And therefore, the other person would then likely be, logically, the Father. And so this passage is clearer, Revelation 6. And we do have this distinction made here um, that gives us a clue there. And 20, again, that is not the case. So um, the suggestion would be that maybe taking the clue from Revelation 6 may point us uh, rather to the idea in Revelation 20 that that may be the Father as well. Paul? Go back to that. Uh, there must be a textual mm -hmm. issue going on there too because the New King James, I don't have the other reference, the others in front of me, but the New King James in verse 17 Okay. Yeah, I'm quoting the Net Bible there. Uh -huh. Well, the, the standard Greek text that we use now has there, too. Now, maybe it's the text, Textus Receptus, that has a different version, but the standard um, Nesta Alan text that we use in the Greek New Testament has also definitely the plural. So it seems to be that the plural would be original. And that would, again, be a clue um, that this is indeed talking about two different uh, persons here, which makes good sense in the context of revelations in general. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're welcome. Well, thanks for asking. You're always welcome, too. Okay, so that was Revelation 20, and then this quote, another quote from Scott Harrell. In light of the complexity of the textual evidence, it seems best to say that the direct execution of judgment has been passed to the, to the Son, while the Father stands behind the Son, affirming, reinforcing, and in some sense also acting. To the son is given the right and role to, um, how do you say this, meet, met, meet out punishment. But there remains a sense in which the father continues also as Lord Chief Justice. In this role, as in others, it is helpful to remember that each member of the Trinity is present in every act of God, either in a primary or a secondary role. Okay, so what he is saying here, again, is what I've said a couple times. It's not exclusive. Yeah? It's not in the sense that only one person is taking on this responsibility all by himself alone. They share, they do this together in each of their responsibilities. But still, one of them seems to have a primary uh, function or a primary um, um, yeah, role in this responsibility. And so, in this case, again, it would go back to the Father who stands behind the Son, who is performing or executing the judgment then. Further questions on these first three roles that we have looked at so far? Yes, please.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yes, but it uh, depends a lot on the background of the person. For example, you can go to India and evangelize, and a, people may, a person may receive Jesus happily, um, and then they, they, you will ask them if he's God, and he will say, yes, he's God, and you may not notice that he's just adding him to his pantheon where he has 40,000 other gods, right? Uh, so it depends a lot on the person and their background. So, um, so there's not a general answer in that sense um, to that question. Um, but yes, I mean, in order for Jesus to be able to save us, he had to be God and he had to be man. Um, and that had to be in, the, in this general Trinitarian understanding. Now, this will not always be an explicit part of what we teach people, but we have to listen enough to them to see if there is something in the background in their understanding about God that's in the way. Is there something there that where they have an, an, an understanding of God that is just um, in contradiction with the God of the Bible? And that will be more often the case if a person comes from another religion, like Hinduism or Islam. You know, if a person grew up a nominal Christian, then usually that may not be as much of an issue. And therefore, evangelism is a little bit more straightforward, carefully speaking. Um, but it would still be valuable you know, and it's always valuable to ask questions and see what the other person understands when they speak about God. Some people in evangelism provocatively told people who deny God, once they described the God they denied, they said, well, I also don't believe in that God. You know, you're an atheist, you don't believe in God. Well, in that God that you don't believe in, I also don't believe in, because it's not the image of God that we have. So it's worth... Uh, probing sometimes a little bit and otherwise I would say when a person comes to faith well it's also a question of discipleship and helping the person then understand more about who that God is that he or she has received and what that means and and that is obviously something that goes on for a lifetime Um, so yeah Mm Okay. Well, then actually that would help rather than uh, disturb you, I hope, because I'm saying that the primary role is given to the Father in that sense. Uh, and therefore, you can maintain that in that sense, maybe. Yeah, Pastor Paul, add something? I'm just thinking about you know, what we're hearing today versus what would have been taught uh, 100, 300, 500 years ago. So is uh, like that term divine fountain. It's a historical term. So this is an historical term. What about these, uh, like Lord Chief Justice? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is that a term that would be found in in literature of hundreds of years ago, or is this a twenty first, twenty twenty first century? Mm-hmm. Well, it's a good question. I'm not absolutely sure, uh, but I would think that these. I don't know about the exact terms, but this way of thinking of the Father as the center of the divine activity is very much something that's expressed throughout the centuries in classical Christianity. Um, and so um, that has usually been used in Latin with this term fons divinitatis, describing it as the absolute fountain had as the beginning of everything. And um, so, yeah, but I'm not exactly sure how these other terms were used throughout the centuries. Mm-hmm. For popular, you mean, or what do you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm, sh- you know, I'm sure, but I'm not so familiar then maybe with, with, um, with that from an English perspective. I was more looking for stuff in German recently, the last couple of years. 
Um, and there is not much there either, but there is a Catholic scholar who wrote an excellent book uh, that is publicly uh, understandable, um, but he also wrote a technical textbook. He has both, but both in German. He is drawing from, well, he's drawing from the historical, so this concept of the social trinity goes back to the fourth century, uh, to the um, fathers there, uh, really, and he's maybe rediscovering a little bit, not just him, but there are others who are doing that. Um, um, yes, well, and again, so I don't know if this has been published in a, in a, in a lay uh, fashion, so I only know of some more academic parts of that in, in English. Yeah, but it may be, I may not know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I'm presenting it to you in a, uh, yeah, more, hopefully a little bit more understandable way. Other comments, questions? Well, then we go on, we have two more left. Fourthly, the Father is also the compassionate reconciler. And this is something maybe that we don't often think, think about as the Father being that. But it is the Father who sends the Son. That seems pretty obvious. So the Father is the one who has initiated this. It is the Father, therefore, who initiates reconciliation. Well, the famous verse that we all know, John 3.16, now I use the net so it sounds a little different. For this is the way God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So again, it begins with God, the Father. Well, because he's the one who sends the Son. So obviously, it must be the Father who's sending the Son. So again, the Father is the one who initiates this. And therefore, we should not only think about Jesus as this um, person bringing divine love, but it's the Father who loves us and who therefore initiates this by deciding to send the Son. And we can go to other texts as well, 2 Corinthians 5, 18, 19. And all these things are from God, the Father, who has reconciled us to himself through the Son, Christ, and who has given us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's trespasses against them, and he has given us the message of reconciliation. So it is the Father who has established this plan of our redemption. And we can see that again in Ephesians 1. We have already read this with reference to his first role as the fountainhead. But also we can read it here because the specific activity that he's initiating is our redemption. And he does that out of his love towards us. So let's read it again. Blessed is the God and, uh, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. For he, the Father, chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, um, that we may be holy and unblemished in his sight in love. So he has crafted this plan of our redemption even before the creation of the world. And it is, again, the Father together in community with the Son and the Spirit, but he seems to initiate this. And therefore he himself is the compassionate reconciler. Uh, we, the passage goes on to say, he, still the Father, he did this by predesti predestining us to adoption as his son through Jesus Christ, according to the pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace that he has freely bestowed on us in his dearly loved son. So it is the Father who also calls us to salvation, we may see that in Romans 8, 28, 29. And we know that all things work together for the good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And some people ask, and I have said this before, that God, if it is not this, uh, explicit in the context, I take it as referring to God the Father. Um, in many places it also may refer to the Son, but then it's usually expressed in the context. And so here I would take it to mean the Father. And he is the one who has called us according to his purposes to salvation. 
And therefore, he also is the compassionate reconciler. We could add many aspects to that. He forgives sinners. He justifies the guilty. He adopts the newborn believer. And he makes us a new creation. So all of that fits into this role of the father as the one who is the compassionate reconciler. In all this, the Bible directs us to God the Father as the one who loves the world, reconciles it to himself, and calls believers to carry on the task of as spokespersons of that grace. In the Trinitarian outworking of uh, cosmic history, salvation originates from the Father. So that's what we've said, that he is the origin of this plan of our salvation. Nearly every world religion requires human beings to reconcile themselves to God or the gods. Religions exist as efforts to build pathways to approach God, to placate the gods, to earn approval, if not forgiveness, through lists of human activities, payments, and rituals. But diametrically contrary to the selfish role sometimes assigned to the God of the Bible, it is the Father's love for the world and his gracious offer of reconciliation that demonstrates his self-giving disposition. The father of the prodigal sons, son, sons has made a way for forgiveness and renewed relationship. So it is the father, we can also think of the story of the prodigal son, he is the one who in his love is waiting for the son to return and he is the one who um, yeah, initiates this. So we can think about human fathers again, this is a picture of um, a father and his son who reconciled after being separated for many decades. And um, I like this picture because it shows an adult father and an adult son. And maybe that is something that we can also see, that God the Father in this mature way is reaching out to us to reconcile us to himself. Or another image, um, this is from a famous Russian war movie called The Father of a Soldier. And uh, again it shows father and son, and here is the son in the war. And this is an active father. And this is a tough father, but it is a loving father who is going even to the battlefield um, to taking his son, his injured son, and he just picks him up and takes the son home. I think it's a very touching um, picture and image for me to see what a father, what a father can be like and um, yeah, how valuable and how, what the beauty even of this tough fatherhood can be. And that is the father we have in heaven. That is how he is and that is how we are also to reflect him as fathers and men on this earth. He is a father with deep love, with deep commitment. Um, yeah, and, and this captures that aspect of it for me very um, emotionally. And so we see this is one of the roles of the father. He is also the compassionate reconciler who reaches out to us and who initiates salvation and who is sending the son to us to bring us back to himself. It's not a role just of the son, but it's primarily even the father who is initiating this. And then we come lastly to him to whom all things return. As all things trace back in primal time to the Father, so in the end of world history, all things return to him. At the consummation, all that is given to the Son is returned to the Father. And one passage that we have that particularly speaks about this, that is really difficult for, for us to understand, and it will remain so, um, but that may be best understood in this way that we just said, is from 1 Corinthians 15, 24, to 28. Then comes the end when he, this is referring to Christ, hands over the kingdom of, to God the Father, when he has brought to an end all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be eliminated is death. For he has put everything in subjection under his feet. But when it says everything, 
has been put in subjection, it is clear that this does not include the one who put everything in subjection to him. And when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will be subjected to the one who subjected everything to him, so that God may be all in all. So here we see that the Father is the one to whom all things return, and even the Son will return what's been given to him in the end to the Father. So God the Father is in some sense primary at the end of time. The Father receives from the Son what he initiated through the Son at the beginning. So it's almost like closing the circle, it's full circle. Yet eternally there is some shared regency with the Son. Well, we may look at the end of Revelations to take a clue that this might be the case where we see in Revelations 21, 22, and 23, Now I saw no temple in the city, because the Lord God, the all-powerful, obviously referring to the Father, and the Lamb, that is referring to the Son then, are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, because the glory of God lights it up, and its Lamb is the Lamb. So God the Father and God the Son somehow together here at the end of Revelations and the end of time. Still, it seems that the Father is the one to whom all things return. So yeah, um, there remains some mystery in this, but this seems to be the best that we can say about this. And this would make sense if we compare it with the beginning, with the first role of the Father, because there he was, the ultimate beginning as the divine fountainhead, and then repeating all the roles. We see him as the sovereign ruler, as the Lord Chief Justice, as the compassionate reconciler, and also as the one to whom all things return in the very end. Those are the roles of the Father. Questions and comments? Yes, please. Yes, exactly. But the Father in Ephesians 1 is more the one who, if we look at eternity past, even before creation, has sort of designed this plan of salvation. Of course, again, together with the Son and the Spirit, not exclusively by himself, but he still seems to be the one who is initiating that. He is the subject of the sentence from a grammatical perspective. He is the one who does these things, and he, he works them out through the other two through the Son whom he is sending and through the Spirit whom they both are sending. And for us, from our perspective, from this end, it is the Spirit that maybe in that sense is the last one coming closest to us who is uh, giving us a spiritual understanding of this truth, uh, of this message that's come to us through the Son from the Father. So Father, Son, and Spirit. And they all three work together. But it seems to be initiated beginning in that sense with God the Father. And therefore... Um, yeah, it is not just the Son that's um, impersonating divine love, if we will, but it's also the Father who is even behind that, sending the Son, who is the compassionate reconciler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're welcome. Other comments or questions? Buddy? Buddy? 